page 23. All right, so at the beginning of this chapter, Don Quixote was upset because he realized that he did not have a squire. What's a squire? Brooklyn? Uh-huh, good, like an assistant or a servant or a helper of some sort, an aide. Okay, very good. So, uh, throughout this chapter, Don Quixote has come across a couple instances where he's tried to help. It hasn't exactly worked, but what happened in the couple pages before this? The merchants were coming down the road, and Don Quixote demanded that they stop and do what? He demanded they stop and, Luke? That's right. Say that Lady Dulcinea is the most beautiful woman in the world. Okay? I like how he said that. I know. I know. Between our Renaissance unit and Don Quixote, we're having a lot of fun with our accents in here. Lots of fun. Okay, so we're on, yeah, Botticelli is one of our favorite ones. All right, page 23. Arriving after nightfall at Don Quixote's house, he explained how he found him lying on the road and handed him over to the care of the housekeeper and his niece, who, along with the parish priest and the village barber, were just then earnestly discussing Don Quixote's six-day absence. He had been gone for six days, and he had just made it back, and they were just discussing, where is he? They had no idea where he had been. They were glad to see him home again, though shocked at his sad condition. Since they could get nothing from him except wild ravings about confronting ten enormous giants, they put him to bed, where he soon sank into a long and deep sleep. That night, all four of them unanimously resolved to destroy the books that had been so instrumental in befuddling the brain of the unfortunate gentleman. Why do they want to destroy all his books? Matthew? Um, so he would stop being so... So he would stop reading these books of romantic chivalry and getting his brain all kind of whacked out. So they picked out all the books of chivalry from Don Quixote's library, threw them out the window into the courtyard, and made a bonfire of them. But that was not enough. They took the extra precaution of walling up the door to the library, feeling sure the knight could be persuaded that the room and its books had vanished by magic. Indeed, some days later, when that excuse had to be made, Don Quixote accepted it easily and at once declared that the disappearance was the work of his arch enemy, the powerful magician Preston. Okay, so they destroyed his old books. They walled up the library, meaning they built walls over the door. Okay, and they were sure they could convince Don Quixote that the library had just vanished out of magic. Okay. And when that time came, they did convince him that. And he was convinced his enemy, Freston, had done that to him. Okay? Riley? Mm -hmm. Just go like this and need tissue. For 15 days, Don Quixote was nursed by his friends, recovering strength in his body and calmness in his mind. Though he occasionally still showed signs of, of still being afflicted with his peculiar craze. After that time, when he was able to move about and go outdoors, he began meddling privately with the man he had thought about as a squire, a simple-minded and gullible laborer named Sancho Panza. This was the man he had originally intended to be his squire. He promised him all kinds of benefits, particularly that he would reward him with the governorship of a province or island at the end of a great adventure. By such enticements, he won Sancho's consent to his wild scheme. The knight next set about raising money for the expenses of repairing and replacing his armor and weapons and all the necessary preparations for a fresh expedition as a full-blown knight errant. Is he going to go out again? Yes. Yes. Are his friends going to be happy? No. No. Now, a problem arose over the over a mount for the new squire, meaning something to ride on, who had only a donkey to ride on. Don Quixote tried in vain to remember any mention in the books he had read about a squire being so mounted. In the end, he decided to make do with a donkey until a better animal could be had by seizing it from the first 
rude knight that he might encounter. Everything being arranged, Don Quixote and his squire stole away in the middle of the night, unknown to anyone, and by daybreak were far enough away to be safe from interference from their friends. They followed the route Don Quixote had originally taken, talking for a long time about the circumstances under which a knight errant was able to grant a governorship or even a kingdom to his squire. Sancho Panza was mightily well pleased. What did Don Quixote promise to give to Sancho if he would serve him as a squire? Ian? Um, he promised to give Sancho. Wait, is that the same? Uh-huh. And um, so he said he'd give him his own private... Uh-huh. His own private... After their, after their great adventure. <laughs> <laughs> after their great adventure was to go blah, 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 right? Correct. Okay. Excellent. So, he had promised to give Sancho Panza his own island and that Sancho would be the governor of that island. Or he would be the president or he would be in charge. Okay. And that was kind of like their deal. If you promise to be my squire, I will give you governorship of an island. They were still talking when they came in sight of 30 or 40 windmills in the plain before them. Seeing them, Don Quixote shouted, <gasps> Chance has brought us better luck than we could have hoped for. See there, Sancho, 30 or more enormous giants. I shall attack and destroy them all, and we shall be rich with their spoils, as is legal in warfare. And in addition... It is a service to God to rid the world of such an evil race. Um, what giant? asked Sancho. <laughs> Those over there with the great arms, answered his master. Um, why, your honor, said Sancho. Those are not giants, but only windmills. And what you're calling arms are the sails, which, being turned by the wind, cause the millstones to work. Oh, it is evident, replied Don Quixote, that you are not experienced in adventures of this sort. They are giants, surely enough. And if you are afraid, you had better go back a little distance, while I engage them in fearful and unequal battle. So saying, the knight spurred on Rocinante, ignoring the cries of his squire, who warned him that he was indeed attacking windmills. But so fixed was Don Quixote on the idea that they were giants, that he would not listen to his squire, or see with his own eyes what was plain enough in front of him. Forward he went, yelling, Fly not, cowards and scoundrels! It is only a solitary knight who attacks you! <laughs> Just then, the wind rose a little, and the great sails of the windmill began to revolve. Don Quixote shouted out, Though you wave more arms than Briones, you will still answer to me! And commended himself to his lady Dulcinea, he charged at a full gallop against the nearest windmill. The lance passed through the sail, which caught it and broke it. But not before Don Quixote and his steed, or his horse, were dragged up with it and then thrown down on the ground some distance away. Okay, so what happened is the windmill begins to blow right as Don Quixote comes racing up to it. He stabs the windmill, which get his spear gets stuck in the windmill. The windmill continues to blow, picks him up and his horse, and throws him. Okay? <laughs> Sancho Panza rushed to help him, exclaiming, Bless the Lord! Did I not tell your worship these were only windmills? And no one could mistake them for anything else unless he had something like them in his own head. Silence, Sancho! replied Don Quixote, slowly recovering from his injuries. In war, things are strangely liable to sudden changes. Indeed, even more so than I supposed. It is clear that the crafty Freston 
who stole my library, changed these giants into windmills in order to cheat me of the glory of defeating them. Such is his hatred of me. But in the end, his tricks will be useless against the power of my sword. As God pleases, answered Tonto Franza, as he busied himself putting his master and Rocinante back in condition to continue their journey. They had not gone far when Sancho remarked that it seemed to be near dinner time. Don Quixote replied that he did not feel hungry just then, but Sancho might eat whatever he pleased. With this permission, the squire arranged himself as well as he could in the back of his donkey. Taking some provisions, or some food supplies, from his pouch, he began to eat with great satisfaction, drinking long and often from a flask of wine he carried. On the whole, he thought it was, you know, pleasant enough to go about in the country seeking adventures, even if they might be dangerous to others. Okay, and that's the end of chapter two. Yay.